Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 144, for Monday, December 11th, 2017. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? I'm doing good, man. We're getting deep into the holiday season here. Lots of stuff going on. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You uh, you sound you sound marvelous today, Paul. It's, well, thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, we've made many technical changes here. One that we talked about, which is uh, improving your internet connection. So we're all going to knock on all sorts of wood that that uh, that in fact was the issue that we dealt with before. But we also moved from Skype to Discord, which is a different app for doing this stuff. And any podcasters out there that do that do things the way we do them, I highly recommend checking it out because the sound is so much better. So it's nice having you here, Paul. Thank you, man. What's yeah. going on with you? Oh, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. I, I want to, before we get too deep into uh, the show and forget about everything that we had scheduled, I want to share two shows ago in uh, 142, we talked about, we had the volume discussion and, <laughs> <laughs> and we actually got a lot of feedback on that. Andy Dolph, who was on the show, professional sound engineer that I've worked with a few times, um, he of course had some comments and shared them with us. And, uh, and I just kind of wanted to read them because he, uh, though he agrees with most of what we said, he has a way of packaging it up that uh, might be, uh, helpful to hear just in it from a different perspective. So Andy says, uh, I guess it's not surprising that the sound guy weighs in on the volume discussion. I really agree with basically everything you said. A few thoughts. Understanding masking is very helpful. One sound in a given pitch range makes it harder to hear other sounds in the same pitch range. It basically doesn't matter how loud the kick drum is. It's never going to cover a vocal. But a bass guitar produces sound all over the frequency range, so it can really interfere with a vocal. He said, so I'd recommend using EQ to carve out a chunk of frequency real estate for each instrument or section to be prominent. That Then you can hear all of them all at once. He says, if I can have it however I want, in a situation where everything is in the PA, i.e. a mic or a DI on every instrument, the lower the volume can be on stage, the cleaner I can make it in the house. Often, he says, cleaner is better, but not always. If it gets too much in the way of the vibe on stage, the performance may sound technically great, but emotionally flat. So it's always a compromise. It's worth noting that in a lot of small clubs, you don't want everything in the PA. And then it's much more of a balancing act. If it's not in the PA, I can't fix it out front. And then he shares some tricks. He says, number one, get the amps as close to and pointed directly at the ears of each player as possible. Raise them up on a chair or a case. Tilt back if possible. You probably need more of yourself than anyone else on stage or in the audience will ever want. That way you can get it. And the closer the amp can be, the quieter it can be produced the same volume at your ears. Obviously, if you are on in-ears, that doesn't apply. And if you move it a lot, that can affect it too. Or if you move a lot, that can affect it too. He said, but just putting an amp on a chair and tilting it up, up, up a bit can really, really help. Lastly, he says, if you have a decent PA, use at least uh, use the least powerful instrument amp you can to get the sound you want from mic it with a great mic uh, and get the level you need from the monitors and mains. He says, if the look of giant stacks of amps and cabinets is important to your band, use props or real cabinets that you don't connect to anything. So there you go. Thanks, Andy. That's uh, Andy's a good listener. He's actually commented on a lot of things that we've had discussions about. He actually shares a lot of really useful insights. So yeah. Andy, thanks a lot for adding that. And so again, you know, for, for, for the bands that have a, a pro sound guy there or, or a, or a working sound guy, they're, they're able to kind of like dial these types of things in, but that concept about, about carving out frequency ranges for each person, 
you know, Dave, just share a little bit. Like you have two guitar players and two amps and they're sharing the same frequency general spectrum. How do right. you differ? How do, what do you do to EQ to actually differentiate two very similar sonic instruments? Yeah, no, with two guitars. Th- so there's two things that I would go after. And of course, it's very easy for me to say this, never being the guitar player on stage. Um, number one is is exactly this, where you would kind of listen to the way each guitar player plays and decide, all right, you know, this one's playing more uh, like chunkier rhythm stuff. So we can carve out some of the high end and just give them a little bit of that low mids, but not so much that it's, you know, getting in the way of the bass. And then maybe the other one's playing leads. So you want a little bit more high end. Or if you're in kind of a funk band or something where you've got that, 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 that waka chicka, you know, kind of thing going on, maybe you want to lose some, some low mids on the guitar and just come up to that. Really, though, each guitar player should be listening to what the other does and not playing the same thing. Like, it's very rare, from my perspective, that you'd want two guitar players playing, you know, open chords with the same strumming pattern in any given song. That that just tends to create mud. There there are perfect examples that, that refute that out there. But in general, that that's just not how that's not how it it goes right. best, right? You, you know, and so you, you want to have maybe one guy playing the open chords and then the other, you know, playing like little fill in things or, or maybe a little riff or something like that. So that they're, but that's, that's a kind of a weird statement because now you have the sound dictating the arrangement of the guitar parts. It really absolutely. should be the other way around. Well, see, I, I, I don't, I disagree with that. I think the sound like that, that's something you have to learn as a band is, how to sound good. And part of that is like getting your harmonies in tune. And part of it is learning how to make your amp sound good. And part of it is learning how to fit your instrument into the band overall. And if everybody's playing the same thing, all like at certain times that can be really effective. It can be kind of punchy and all of that. But in general, you don't want people doubling and tripling up on, on parts. You, you want to, you want to carve out space. You know, the stones, the stones are like the perfect example of that. Although, uh, you know, I don't know how much of that was like just, you know, the universe smiling upon them. Serendipitous. Yeah, exactly. But I have to think, you know, like when Ron Wood came into the band, Keith and he must have had a conversation about, all right, man, here's how it's going to work. Although on any given night, they might have, you know, crossed parts all night long and they but they were clearly listening to each other. And yeah. playing around each other. And that's that's really the key is playing around each other I, in most. So styles. I, I, yeah, I would agree with you that um, it doesn't make any sense to have two people playing the exact same part. Right. However, I would also say that, um, you know, depending upon the style of music and depending upon, you know, the vibe of the song, you might have one person, you know, strumming and one person arpeggiating a guitar part in the sure. same part of the neck. And that might be part of the sound. So by definition, the two guitars don't have to be in different parts of the neck to accomplish, you know, what you're describing. Correct. Complementary parts. And even with the stone stuff, I mean, I think, you know, they're largely. The stone stuff is a, to me, it's a different exercise because the stone stuff is, is literally. Similar sounding guitars that are weaving in and out of parts, like it's staying true. out of each other's way. No, it's they're, true. They're they not, sound the same. Yeah. But but the genius of the stone stuff is it works. And like you said, this the the mystical, <laughs> you know, universal, you know, uh, amazing thing about the stones is just, you know, this intuitive listening. I don't think you can. I think we've talked about this before. You hear a lot of stones covers. Yeah. Very, very few guitar bands get it right in terms of. You know, that we they, Keith Richards calls it weaving, right? You know, where they just, uh, you know, one guy hits a chord, one guy suspends the chord, one guy slides up on the chord, you know, yeah. that type of thing. That's just that is that is the equivalent of, of you know, Beatles harmonies and Beatles songwriting. You know, there's just something about the universe that, that put those things in place. Totally. And similarly, the, similarly, the bass lines that accentuate you know, stay out of the way of what those guitar players right. are doing. Well, and that's it. But, you, you have to think about it. it you, you know, it, I always think about African music, right. And, and um, like traditional African music, especially where there's like a million drummers playing different parts. Each individual part is very, very simple. And, and 
you know, diving into that music, you can sort of learn how that kind of thing can come about that the stones have with the guitars, right? That where it's like, yeah, just like find your space and know where the other people's space is. And I think like, and of course we've taken a conversation about sound and brought it into playing, but again, it's all the same thing. The goal is to make it sound good as one. And to do that, you have to be aware of what everyone else is doing. You can't, you can't just put blinders on and say, I'm going to play, you know, this drum groove, no matter what. Now there are times when it's like, uh Oh, band needs to get on, on track. I am going to play this drum groove no matter what. But most of the time it's no, I'm listening and, and, you know, not only listening to the crowd and not only listening to the band, but also like paying attention to the crowd and what's working there. And from a drummer's perspective, that happens all the time when people are dancing, uh, I have a very different view of my job than I do when people are just sitting and watching, right? It's a, it's yeah. a different thing. And so it's, it's that awareness of everything that's going on um, and being affected by, by what you're playing. So. so to bring that whole conversation around, the goal of good sound is to be able to have each, each instrument, including voice, sonically carve out a space in the, in the sound spectrum that is uniquely theirs. Yeah. And those things can be, uh, you know, they live in a, in a kind of a different space and can be totally adjusted in a different space. But that's, that's the goal of how to get not mush, not right? mush. Yeah. And it's helpful I, for me. It was helpful to like take some multi-track recordings. Either you make them yourself or you can, I mean, you can even find like projects online and just start even in garage band or, you know, you can get audacity for free or whatever, whatever you want. Just start playing a Reaper actually is a really good one, uh, a good digital workstation that you can mess with on your computer and and just start playing around with this. Right. Thinking about EQ and, and using a graphic EQ or even a parametric EQ to start to to visualize where the sound lives. And once you sort of get a feel for visually where the sound lives across the, you know, the spectrum of human hearing. Then you can start to like see like, all right, this sound like I think I talked about it on the show when we were EQing the fling recordings that we did a couple of years ago. I I had this idea like the bass just sounded like mud. And what I did was I I, I, and I thought it was the craziest thing to do. But I'm like, this is what it sounds like I should do. So I'm just going to do it is I put a high pass filter on the bass, which essentially takes the low end out of the bass guitar. And I brought that high pass filter up to like 150 hertz, which I thought would just like totally neuter the bass. And it didn't. It brought out this beautiful quality of the bass that was controllable. And yet it you could hear it took the mud out. And it was like, mm. oh, I never would have thought like I always thought the bass had to live down in the, you know, like the 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 30 to 50 hertz range to get that thump or whatever. No, no. Leave the kick drum pedal down there and uh and, and move the bass out of the way. And suddenly everything, like the whole thing, it just took this extra energy, like sonic energy out of it and cleaned it up. And then it sounded right. good. Yeah. So just playing in a, in a low stakes environment, like, like where you, you're just sitting at home and playing with, you know, your audio workstation, you'll learn how to get these things and where they, where they fit and where they don't. And, uh, and then you start notching out, you know, and the vocals have to live here. So no matter what, you know, we I'd have, have to imagine online somewhere there's um, some broad guide as to where the various parts of a rock band live in the sonic spectrum that we could we could share in the show notes. I would think. imagine that's true. If anybody Let's knows of one, something. we'll look for one. Yeah. But if you know of one uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com, we'd love to hear, uh, cool. hear about that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Uh Oh, did I lose you, Paul? Oh. We knocked on too much wood. Not good. Mr. Kent, I see you. Are you there? Yeah, I hear you. What happened? I don't know. All right. Huh. Well. Uh-oh. You knocked uh-oh. on too much wood. I think I knocked on too much wood. Could you hear me the whole time? The whole time. That's interesting. Uh, we'll just ignore that. We'll just. Discord. It didn't happen. That's right. We have some discord with our discord. Yeah. Interesting. All right. You want to, uh, you, you want to, so we had Brian on Facebook ask 
Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian Clark asked, have the drummer auditions happened? I'd love to hear about Paul and the House Rockers drummer audition process on the podcast. A lot of us have gone through this at some point, and it would be beneficial for the listeners to hear you guys talk about some of the behind the scenes <laughs> info of this process. So we talked about it a little bit, but he's right. We didn't really circle back around on that. It's kind of a tale of woe, actually. So it, this is going to be a very unsatisfying story, Brian. So here's, here's the deal. Um, some of the guys in the band, you know, we had a couple subs when we were going through this process of transition. Our regular guy was first taking a little bit of time off and then a little bit more time off, but we had some shows to play. So we had a couple subs of guys that we knew. And from that, um, you know, the two guys were both, you know, really good musicians and they were both good candidates for it. So given the fact that we were talking about the two of them, then we went to, well, let's just see who else is out there, you know, because this is a pretty good gig, pays pretty good, works a lot, good guys, you know, good situation. So let's just see, you know, what's out there. So I took, you know, the standard tax. I, you know, put something on Craigslist. I called band leader friends of mine. I called booking agent friends of mine and said, if you know anyone looking for a regular gig, we're looking to, we're looking for someone. And I got, I think I got a total of about 25 or 30 referrals and then uh what i'd asked for was video if possible or where i could go see someone if possible and i did go out and see a couple drummers in the process leading up to this and because we had a finite amount of time we decided we were going to whittle down <clears throat> we we're going to whittle down the pool to six people and do three consecutive weeks of two drummers a night okay um about a month before we settled on the six you know people and settling on the six people um, also had to do with uh, me calling them and kind of doing a little bit of a phone interview with them to to you know make sure they were on board with the commitment and you know understood what the pay was and just kind of making sure that all the basics that so we're not wasting our time with those six yeah. weeks, right? Yeah, you got to vet them out. The playing is their ability to play your songs is only a piece and perhaps not even the most important piece above a minimum level of proficiency. You can yep. fit the band. Yeah, of course. And then interestingly enough, of those 25-ish uh, referrals that we got or, you know, the pool that grew, some, several of them were excellent musicians and were full-time pro musicians. And when we kind of got into the requirement of the commitment, they fell out. You know, yeah. they wanted the, and, you know, it got, it, they went immediately to, well, you know, I can't I can't put everything else on hold for one band. I got too many other things going on. Uh, but if you ever need a sub, use me. And, you know, you know, they were good players and you know, clearly experienced players. But, it, you know, I'm still trying to have a band, not a collection of whoever's available at right. any one time. So, right. so we're now down to six people. And, and of the six, two were the ones that had been subbing for us. One was another local guy that we knew that, that uh, we'd seen that we were really knocked out by and, and thought he would be interesting to play with. And the other three were the result of referrals. Um, we start the process of, you know, like I said, I did, I did the call downs and uh, I gave them all a month. So, you know, I used that format that you shared with me about, you know, how to prep someone for, yeah. for an audition. Yeah. Gave them the songs, gave them the links to the songs, gave them the address, gave them the time, their time slot, gave them, you know, come this early, you know, be ready to go. Here's how much time you'll have to set up. Here's how big the drum riser is. Um, I think it was a five by five drum riser. So that was going to be an issue. That's you know, if someone yeah. brought it. Right. So, um, you know, all the information had our ducks totally in a row. And so that's a month out and now we're getting down to it. Now, interestingly, um, I heard from, I heard from five of the six people. Cool. Thanks. Right. Great. Yeah. Okay. On it. Going to start working on the tunes. We get down to things and we get to, about 10 days before first audition. And one of the people scheduled for that night calls and says, Hey, um, you know, I decided it's not going to be for me. We're down to five. Now i actually, I have at that point, do I want to start filling those slots with someone else? Right. Right. I decided not to. Right. Okay. Yeah. If you feel like you had a good pool from the five that were left, that's right. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, now we're going along. And another one, the one local guy who we liked, he's like, yeah, it's not really my type of music huh. down to four. Right. Better, to, better to find out now than six months from now. Yep. 
go down to three. You know, another one of the guys never, never responded. We'll go down to three. Now we're down to three, and two of the ones are the guys that we played with. Oh, and uh, and then <laughs> the, the, and then the, the actual audition starts to become less and less uh, relevant. Well, now I want you to understand: I have put a ton of time in this, and I made a very conscious decision as a leader to take the democratic input of my band because I wanted them all to feel buy-in. Of course. Um, well, not of course, because in the past I've made the decision on like when we've replaced guitar players. Oh and, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I've just said, you know, I'll go out and find the right guy for us. Yep. Took some input, but I made the final call and made it fairly quickly. So, but this one felt because Joe had been in the band for so long and it was such a major change to the chemistry of the band. I really wanted everybody's buy-in. So we're down to three, one guy who we just liked and then two people who'd been playing with us. And since it was three, now we had two on one night and one on another night. Now the two on the one night by design were the two guys who had played with us. Cause okay. I wanted the band to really freshly hear both of them. And cause it was, you know, to me it was likely it was going to be one of those two guys. Makes right? sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the band said, let's spread them out. You know, let's work out with them even more. Let's play, you know, longer with them. And let's, you know, since we're down to three guys. And again, I, I put a lot of time into this between the recruiting people, the call downs, the vetting people. Yeah. Just listen you know, to your, your, tell the story here. It's obvious. I'm, I'm a little, I'm frustrated, right? No, you know, no, little, it's, and it's obvious you put a ton of time in. Yeah. Right. And then, so when I go to move one of the guys to another week, who is one of the guys who had been playing with us, and this is a guy we know, he sends me a one liner email back saying, you know what? I've decided to stay with my current band. Oh. So now we're down to the two guys. And actually at this point in time, I'm, I'm somewhere between pissed and frustrated. I just said, you know what? I'm going to go with the guy who was the other guy who's been subbing with us, who I liked all along. I know he'll fit. And so I just kind of laid down the law. And so th this is a, a, a long and winding tale of good intention, you know, desire to have, right. And flaky yeah. musicians and good, uh, good you know, intentions often wind you in that spot that you so eloquently described as somewhere between pissed and frustrated. Yeah. Well, that's it. And, and actually, let me just say this. So the guy that we ended up with is a really well-known local drummer. I mean, he's excellent. He's super. He was not thrilled that he was being put through an audition process, but I kind of stuck to my guns and I, and I was like, you know, I, I really this is part of my process for keeping my band bought into this type of thing. Yeah, well, I yeah, I would say to me, that's a huge warning sign. Uh, if you are so full of yourself and I'm I. Oh, no, no, I no, that's not this. He, he, okay. Remember, he did gigs with us. He'd already done all the prep. He'd already learned our show. Got he's it. put in a lot of time for us to know exactly what he was about. So it's not it's not that. OK, it's not. Remember, that. OK, this, that's no, 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 it's not that. And the point that I'm kind of getting to is then we get to the point where I call him. And I say, I want to offer you the gig. And he goes, well, what happened to the auditions? And I said, it's a long tale. But you know, so this guy was like, really, you're going to make me audition after I put in all this time to learn your sure, show? And, all that's stuff. Different. Okay. and I was and I felt horrible about that. Right. <laughs> so now now I'm like, yeah, never mind the auditions. And he's like, all right. And, um, and then he asked me a really good question. And he goes, are you sure I'm the guy? Am I just the lowest common denominator, the old last guy standing for all this type of stuff? Because that's not a good situation either. Right. And I totally empathize. And, and remember, this is a smart great guy. Smart question. Really? Yeah, it absolutely smart question. is. He, yeah. you, know, you know, this guy can play with anybody and he has, he has other options. Um, he wanted our gig because it's a good fit for him. But, sure. you know, you know, he's a professional and he's, <laughs> you know, he's a, he's, he's a really good guy. And so he asked the question, are you, are you sure you want me? Or am I just, you know, your least... The yeah. last guy standing. And now I felt really bad because I wanted him from the beginning. And, and, uh, you know, I was like, dude, you know, I think the world of you, I think the band thinks the world, as I've said before, there was a process Yeah, and, you know, I was committed to the process and I felt we had to go through it, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, we want you, it's going to be a great, a great situation for all of us, you know, join the band and let's, let's start building something new. Because that's really what it is. That's I mean, it. you yeah. bring in well, a drummer, it, it's a new band. It, it, in, in many ways, not in all the yeah. ways, but in many ways. Yeah, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the morals of the story are, are, you know, good intentions, a lot of preparation, a lot of time. Musicians are flaky. At the end of the day, when it's not enough money that it's someone's real job. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that level of commitment there is, you still have this level of, I, I don't know that I would have, I don't know that I would have done anything different 
here and now. I probably would have vetted earlier and tried to figure out. I would have asked different questions to try to figure out where the flaky stuff comes from. Interestingly, yeah. the one guy who remember there was one other guy who I actually just called and said, "Hey, a friend of ours is available, and you know we just have decided we're going to go with him." Sure. And that poor guy, you know, you know he had he had prepared and he had done a few things, and probably not the coolest thing on our on our part towards him. He was a real gentleman about it. He goes, you know, you should play with who you want. You know, I think yeah. I could have added something, and it was cool. But you know, it's that question: should a should a leader just do what he needs to do because of this stuff? Like I said, it, it ultimately wasted quite a bit of my time. Mm -hmm. Should I just take care of business, found a good drummer, and you know, set that expectation with my band? Maybe, well, probably. Let, let me. I I, I um. I have some thoughts about that on, on this side of the equation. If I, you know, if I'm not the band leader, uh, the fact that you went through that process and, and of course I'm hearing your description of, I haven't, you know, obviously haven't talked to any of the guys in your band about it to hear their perspective. But if I were even able to get 50% of that message from you as part of this process that look, you know, I want all of us to be in on this as much as we can be. You know, if anybody knows anybody, bring them in. Let's set it up. We're all going to come and listen to these guys and, uh, you know, play with these guys and and get there. Getting to the end of that process, even if it turns out that you wound up picking the guy, you know, almost by default that you wanted from the beginning. <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, it wasn't by default. It, it, it was, you know, kind of a crazy tale that you just told. But I think being in the band, I think I'd be pretty appreciative of the fact that, yeah, this was this was a group effort in in many ways. And here's where we wound up. And I don't think anybody, even if it didn't feel like a group effort, the, the you know, the fact that you're here with this guy that, yes, you might have chosen two months ago, but anybody else in the band may have had reason to say, God, I wonder if, you know, we had brought in that person would it be better if we'd brought in that person would it be better and you know you have this sort of two month long process of all of these people sort of second guessing yes yeah, second guess well the second guessing might go on two years but you had this two month process of pulling these people in and trying to wrangle them and one by one they all kind of fell off on their own fell off the radar that it kind of limits that process of second guessing at all you're here. It's like, no, this is the right guy. There's no question anymore. We knew it two months ago and we really know it now because everybody else has proven to us that we should have not that, not anybody else, but this guy. So I think, yeah, yeah I think you're good. Hey, I, I well, have a, it was I, a process. Yeah. Um, we do need to do some sound tweaking. Your noise gate is probably very distracting to everyone. Um, I didn't want to stop you in the middle of that segment, but before we do the next thing, I'm going to pause quick and we're going to see if we can dial this in a little bit. Okay. We're back. And I apologize for not dealing with the noise gate stuff earlier. We'll get there. We'll get there. It's a, it's a process. We're here now. We're here now. Oh, you sound delicious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you. Yeah, man. Um, and thanks for everybody for your, for your patience. So I had a, a moment, uh, over the last couple of weeks that, that, uh, very much was one of those, oh yeah, this is what band leaders have to do kind of thing. Uh, now in fling it's, I've made it clear that really there is no band leader. And if there is one, it's Russ. However, we've also made it very clear that on stage, you can't have a democracy. There needs to be someone who's running point for the gig. Uh, you know, what song's next? If a song's going to be cut from the list, that person just needs, you know, you need to have one person who's making all those decisions. You can talk about it later. So um, we played this gig and it was a party for a woman's birthday. It was kind of, it had the flow of like a, a, a wedding type of thing to it, if, for lack of a better uh, better term. And, and so there was, you know, cocktail time where we didn't play, but we had iPod music going and then, and then we played after dinner. So it was that whole reception flow. And this was just people that wanted to, to party and, and dance. And, um, about four songs in our bass player started to play and wanted to play some, this tune called get back home, which is for all intents and purposes might just be an original. It's not, it was written by Ray Pachkowski, who's um, he played in a band with, but also is uh, Trey Anastasio's keyboard player now, but 
um, Berg played in band with him years ago and, and he started playing this tune because he was like, wow, we just, you know, we, we need to play a song just to like settle in and relax. And it's like, and, and I, I was like, no, like nobody here knows that song. It, this is not the place for it. a bar gig. He absolutely like that. Absolutely. But it would have been the right thing. But at that gig, it was like, oh, no, 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 no. Like bad mm-hmm. news. But we, we, we got to play things. People know we got to keep the tempo up. You know, 120 is a good um, a, a good BPM marking to hit for, you know, a gig like that. You just want to keep people up and moving and dancing. And it was one of those, you know, weird reception things where people weren't like just in party mode. Most people came to just celebrate this woman's birthday. So it was like, we got to really keep our game on point here. And, um, and I got this, as, as you might expect, I kind of got this look of disappointment from him. And, and so I spent the rest of the night, like trying to figure out like, okay, how can I appease this, you know, person that wants to play like, and, and I didn't have time to have the conversation about, well, you know, what else could we play that would make you happy? Like, you know, trying to keep everybody happy on stage while also trying to put the best, best product out. And it kind of, you know, kind of ruins the vibe for me for the night when I got to, when I got to do that. Oh, we have a, we have a, a guest. I didn't realize we, we have had a dogs. Guest today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, at the next band rehearsal, I said, Hey, can we just talk about something? I said, you know, the, uh, the pressures on my shoulders during the gig to just carry things through and, and keep the train on the tracks and all that. And when I get these, you know, these looks or anything like that, it really kind of bums me out because, you know, now I'm thinking about, all right, how do I keep everybody happy? while I'm still trying to keep the, the show on the road. And, I'm so glad I asked because here I was in my head thinking, all right, well, you know, he wants to play kind of a loose jammy song or he wants to do, you know, like, like I thought it was all about the style of the song. And he's like, well, I was just hoping to sing a couple for the night because, you know, we brought our stuff and set it all up. And it was like, oh man, I, I, I never, I've certainly experienced that before. It makes sense to me, but it's not where my head goes. I am perfectly happy playing an entire night, never singing a lead vocal in fling. I wind up singing quite a few, Um, but in general, I just, it's not, uh, it's just, it's not a priority for me. So I never like immediately thought, Oh, that's all he wants. Oh, I can fix that. Let's find a song that he sings that fits into what we're doing here. No problem. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the lesson I learned was don't try to guess what people are, are doing, sure. you, you know, and, and just try to try to ask, just ask, that's it. And I, I really never would have thought that, that that was a thing that like really important changes the night for someone, whether, whether or not they get to sing a, a lead I, again, totally makes sense. It just never, never dawned on me. So Well, but you know, those things, they, they, there are exercises in communication in on Correct. many ways because yeah. because there's a few things you know I I write the set list right. I often have people wanting to give me input on the set list and I I shut that down because I don't want ten people's input and one person's input is going to make someone else unhappy and you know this is this makes it a difficult thing right so um you know it's similarly to him you guys have been together long enough communicate before a show because that un you know once once the butt hurt thing starts happening on stage then it, then it's subject to t- interpretation about how to fix it and totally. the energy of the show and those types of things so right, right. you know again this is just one of those things where when it's when it's a democracy that's hard when it's a leader led thing and the leader gives really clear expectations this is it you're going to sing two songs per night if if, you, if, there, if anybody wants to discuss a change to any of these things it's on you to do it beforehand that just works for my brain, man. That that's just like a very clear set of expectations that are, you know, permeated throughout a whole band that people feed back and communicate back to. Oh, it's totally mid show. Yeah. There's so many emotions going on mid show. There's so many interpretations about what's going right and what's going wrong right. at any point in time. And then, you know, when someone wants something mid show, you know, how to communicate that. Because again, you know, if you would have leaned over, he said, Hey, I'd like to say, you know, in the middle of a show sets going great. Hey, I'd like to say a couple more. Right. You know, you have a lot to do with to to decipher that 
that direction, right? <laughs> sure. And it's hard. Again, emotions are going, creativity is flowing. Yep. You know, people are trying to be in the mood. You know, for me, the, the set list thing is, is relevant here because I spend a lot of time. And again, I, I, this is kind of like the drummer discussion. I spend a lot of time on the set list. Well, that was the interesting them. part. I try to create a narrative, right? I, you right. know, I try to do something and for someone to just kind of blow it up in the middle or say, Hey, let's do something else. My first motion of that, that I kind of personally have to learn to deal with is it's not really as big a F you as it feels like at the time. I know how much time I've spent on these types mm. of things. And I certainly have shared with the rest of the band that I spent a lot of time, but in the moment when someone says, Hey, let's do this. My first internal gauge goes to, dude, I spent so much time, you know, how disrespectful is that? That's not really what's happening. And I've had to check myself to learn right. you know, to kind of deal with that emotion. But that's the thing about like in the moment communications when it's, you know, a democratic process is hard. So, you know, I don't actually fault you near as much as, you know, kind of like the responsibility you're taking for this. That's, that's not an easy thing to react to because no, then you, you try to get your, your hands around the entirety of the request. Well, and the, you, you and the thing me. was, it, like, I hadn't written, I write most of the set list the, for this one. The woman whose birthday it was, was our keyboard player's wife. Right. So he had written the list thinking, OK, like, these are the songs that are going to work for her. And right before we went on stage, Burke said, oh, that one song, which happens to be a song he was singing. Again, I'm coming at this from a whole different perspective than he was. He's like, I don't think that song's going to work for this set. And it was uh, R.E.M.'s Don't Go Back to Rockville. I was like, yeah, I think you're right. Like that, that song's going to be a mid tempo navel gazer. Like people are going to, we're going to lose people. Smart move. And, and so when we got to that spot in the set, he started playing this other song and it was like, again, in his mind, it was, well, we should trade one song that I sing for another song that I sing. I wasn't thinking of it that way at all. I was thinking of, yeah, that song's the wrong one. Take it out. Just move on to the next one. We'll figure it out. We have more songs than we need for tonight. Let's just get there. But that's not, mm. we didn't have that detail, the conversation. He was just like, as we were getting on stage, we were talking about pulling out another song, which we did kind of had the same, you know, same issue. He's like, I don't think Rockville works either. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Pull it. And so, you know, when we get to that point in the set, now we have different expectations of what's what happens next, you know, and and it, again, yeah. in his mind, it was, no, this is my slot to sing a song. So I'm going to I I still want to own that slot. It totally makes sense. Never even crossed my mind once, you know, but now it will because because we've had the conversation. So it's like, oh, yeah. it's easy. And then it was like, hey, if you want to sing more, let's give you some of the tunes that are like, you know, party hits so that no matter what happens, like those but let's not negotiate gonna, in the middle of a show, but let's not. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about this at rehearsal. But, but that yeah. way, you know, I would, I would be very happy at a fling gig having him sing, you, you know, take half the songs I'm going to sing, or frankly, all of them. Although there's many of them that are better fits for me to sing than him, but take as many of them as you want. And here they, here you go. Like you sing them. And then, you know, you're you got more than you wanted coming in and we're not worried about, well, if you lose one, the uh, you know, do I have to make it up somewhere in order to to make you feel like your evening's whole? Because, you know, we all we all do this for a label labor of love. What are the things about the night that you love? Well, let's figure that out and then let's make sure you get those. And that's really I guess that's the question is, you know, what it's all you, solvable. What do you it's love? The time and place. That's the time and place. Yeah. 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 Agreed. So it was it? Yeah, it was, it was. It was actually a great little conversation. It was like, oh, okay. I had no idea. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Mm. He's like, yeah. I never said anything. I'm like, great. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Now's not the time. <laughs> well, no rehearsal. This was in rehearsal afterwards. Got it. So then it was. That was the time. But that's yeah, the time. I, and he even said, he's like, oh, I'm sorry. He's like, you know, yeah. I had that moment of disappointment. He's like, but then I just. It was like, no, this party's not about me. It's about, you know, this other woman. We just make the set about her and we're good. And of course, I never got the benefit of that either. So I spent the rest of the <laughs> night, you know, with this weight on my shoulders that didn't actually exist. So funny. Yeah. You know, you know. Hey, so one last thing for today, um, yeah, this afternoon, um, 5 to 7 p.m. at Charlie's in Los Gatos. I'm hosting that that annual musicians uh, happy hour that I've done the last five years. Kind of cool. First year was about 18 people, 15 people, over 150 people will be there this year. Wow. Yeah. So the word got out. It'd be a lot of good musicians, a lot of good networking. And again, I, I don't, 
people can come with whatever agenda they want. I just, I just arrange the place, put out a Facebook invite and, you know, get, and people spread the word. Yeah. You know, some people come to look for bandmates. Some people come, I, I come just to, you know, say, hey, it's cool that we have this nice thriving musical community around here and, you know, have a, have a drink with mostly my friends and meet a couple new people. Um, but, uh, it's going to go on tonight. If anybody listening is, is, uh, around and they want to come on down, I'd love to meet you if I haven't already met you. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's kind of a fun thing. We, um, I called a couple of manufacturers to see if we can get a door prize. Um, a good guy from Mackie is going to donate a pair of uh, studio monitors. And so there's even a little giveaway. Nice. We've got our local guitar store. Keith Holland is providing the munchies. So it's turned into like a little real thing. And it's kind of a, I'm really happy with it. It's, it's, uh, it's rewarding to see the musical community get together. I'm very anal about on the invite saying no fans, please don't, you know, keep this a secret, not secret, but you know, invite your bandmates, invite your sound guy, invite your manager, music industry people, local industry people, please. It's not a, you know, a fan fest type of thing. Right. Right. And so, um, yeah, I've got 150 people, um, a bunch of people I'm looking forward to meeting that I know only by reputation. So that's kind of cool. And, uh, you know, what is good networking in something like this? Like I said, some people are looking for a bandmate. Some people are looking for, you know, hey, our bands should should collaborate on a, yeah. on a date together. Well, you know, there's just, all sorts of cool things. It's just good to know other people. Even, yeah, just good to know other people that are doing the same thing. You can share some war stories and share a drink. And, you know, it, it, I, to me, that's a good idea. I wish you were here. I wish I was here. Yeah, I wish that would be fun. I would love to attend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someday. 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 All right, folks. Well, feedback at giggabpodcast.com is where you can always find us. Find us at uh, on Facebook, too. Hey, there's the sound. I knew it was there it is. out somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, this mixer's a uh, 10-year-old mixer. Sounds- I might need to talk to your friend at Mackie. <laughs> yeah. Always He's had a couple of weird things that always be performing from Paul in Los Gatos and from Hallie the dog in Los Gatos. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take it easy, folks.